World War II, the largest, most brutal conflict of all time. One of the most horrific aspects was the advent of the suicide bomber, the Kamikaze. Now, for the first time in all color, a look at the men who were willing to embrace death and the devastation and agony they caused. These are the Kamikazes. Every time one country gets something, another soon has it. One country gets radar, but soon all have it. One gets a new type of engine or plane, then another gets it. But the Japs have got the kamikaze boys, and nobody else is going to get that, because nobody else is built that way. Captain John Thatch, operations officer to Admiral McCain. By January 1945, 100 American ships were sunk or damaged including two escort carriers sunk, nine larger carriers damaged, five battleships damaged, and there had been 4,000 American casualties. All of that damage was done by 400 Japanese suicide bombers aided by 100 escorts. Was the worst yet to come? The answer to that question would be yes. The Americans were forced to abandon the Philippines in May 1942. Now, starting with October 1944's Battle of Leyte Gulf, they were making the final push to regain the islands. Rear Admiral Takajiro Onishi decided to evacuate what was left of his special attack units, taking with them the remainder of the useful aircraft. He left behind the ground crew and mechanics who had so creatively kept the most dilapidated planes in good enough shape for one final mission. They were ordered to stay behind to fight as infantry down to the last man in their own kind of suicide mission. The pilots themselves continued to have a range of emotions about their missions, a range as varied as the individuals whose volunteering was becoming a lot less voluntary. In fact, reprisals for not answering the call were so severe, some pilots were virtually ordered into their new special attack units. Not everyone felt the compulsion to die. But the motives of each pilot were complicated. The vast majority were quite sane. They were doing their duty they were fulfilling a lifetime of training in samurai ethics and Bushido spirit. Please congratulate me. I have been given a splendid opportunity to die. How I wish I could be born seven times, each time to smite the enemy. I shall return in spirit and look forward to your visit to the Yasukuni Shrine. Flying Petty Officer Matsuo Iseo. With kamikaze units now depleted by their successful missions, a fresh unit was formed on January 18th. They celebrated with a mission to seek out the American fleet off the coast of Formosa. Two of those planes crashed into the USS Ticonderoga, then just one month old. The ship was only saved by the quick thinking of its damage parties as directed by Captain Dixie Kiefer. He purposely flooded the port side. The tilt helped put out the fires. After a busy January, U.S. military planners used a momentary lull in the hostilities to rack their brains about how to counter the suicide plane development. With the Philippines more or less under control, Admiral Halsey withdrew his carrier fleet from the area as he tried to piece together a solution. Even after four months of devastating attacks, the only effective defense the U.S. Navy utilized was shooting at the incoming planes until they disintegrated. 
The kamikaze was not a contingency that had been anticipated by war planners. How were the Allies going to protect themselves against an enemy that wished to die? The first line of defense were the CAPs, or Combat Air Patrols, launched in an attempt to find the enemy before the enemy found them. CAPs were groups of carrier-based fighters whose purpose was to seek out any threats before they found the fleet. The Allies began to see the two main methods of both high and low altitude kamikaze attacks. So the patrols flew in groups that watched the skies from 3,000 feet to 25,000 feet. Better and more powerful fighters were coming off the assembly line to lead the patrols. These planes were built to match the speed of the Zeros and soon dominated the air. One of these new fighters, the F-4U Corsair, took out 2,140 enemy aircraft while only having 189 shot down. Squads had nicknames like the Big Blue Blanket for the color of the aircraft which would cover and protect from the skies above. If a kamikaze did get past combat air patrols, the next line of defense were a ship's anti-aircraft guns. When enemy aircraft were in their sights, the Allies let loose with all they had. One of the most important advancements in the Allies' defense against kamikaze attacks was the development of the variable telemetry fuse, or VT fuse. But to many, it was really known as the funny fuse. The VT fuse was in essence a miniature radar that was placed in the anti-aircraft ammunition of the five-inch guns. A shell equipped with a funny fuse would explode when its signal indicated there was an airplane in lethal range. The effect of the VT fuse was undeniable. Early in the war, only 25% of anti-aircraft ammo were equipped with proximity fuses, yet accounted for 50% of downed Japanese aircraft. By 1945, ammo installed with the VT fuse shot down six enemy aircraft for every one shot down without it. But even with an advantage like the VT fuse, the kamikazes were not deterred from completing their missions. The Allies' best bet when it came to knocking out the Japanese aviation industry and the kamikazes it supplied was the newly introduced B-29. This new bomber was so huge, it earned the nickname Super Fortress 
and it was the biggest aircraft on either side of the war. It could carry nearly 10 tons of bombs and promised to be the advantage that the Allies needed, but they had to get it within safe flying distance of the main island of Japan. Saipan in the Marianas Islands, which had been won by the Americans back in June 1944, was the closest airstrip, but it was some 1,500 miles from Tokyo. That meant that the fighters protecting the B-29s bombing Tokyo only had enough fuel to accompany them on part of the mission, and the bombers themselves had no place to land if they were damaged or had mechanical failures. But there was one island roughly halfway between Saipan and Tokyo. The Americans targeted it as their next conquest. That island was called Iwo Jima. Because it was the only suitable site for an airfield between the Marianas Islands and the home islands, the Japanese knew that one day they would have to defend Iwo Jima. Since the beginning of hostilities, they fortified it with a network of caves and bunkers, the likes of which the U.S. Marines had never seen. On February 19, 1945, the invasion of Iwo Jima began. Facing the Americans were more than 20,000 dug-in Japanese soldiers. No more than 200 would survive to tell the tale. Though there was a slim chance of survival, these last-ditch efforts were their own kind of suicide mission. It was clear that the Japanese soldiers on Iwo Jima were calling on the same spirit and traditions that drove the Kamikaze Corps. The battle for Iwo Jima is remembered as one of the toughest ground battles in the history of warfare. The Allied landings were supported by a huge armada, doing its best to soften up those dug-in fortifications. The Kamikazes, now operating from Formosa, or present-day Taiwan, were preparing to reduce the power of that fleet. Initially, very few of them got through. Then, on the third day of battle, the USS Saratoga was pounded by four separate ramming attacks, causing such damage that her flyers who were up in the air trying to shoot down the bogies had nowhere to land. Saratoga Action Report, 21 February, 1945, 1700 hours. Number one plane, hit and on fire, crashed into starboard side. Penetrated hangar deck. Violent explosions. Number two plane, hit and on fire, hit water and bounced into starboard side at waterline. Number five plane, hit and burning, headed for bridge, carried away antenna and signal halyard, crashed into catapult and exploded violently. Number six plane, hit and crashed into airplane crane on starboard side. Rest of plane went over side. Nearby ships came to the rescue. This was hardly the one plane, one ship ideal that the Japanese admirals and generals wanted. But the multi-aircraft strategy had the desired result. Old Sarah survived, but would never return to combat. On the same day, an escort carrier, the USS Bismarck Sea, was sunk by two kamikazes. This was the third jeep carrier sunk by kamikazes since they began operations. These baby flat tops were only around 500 feet long, compared to the 900-foot Essex-class ships like the Franklin, the Intrepid, and the Hancock. Jeep carriers were never designed to take a direct hit, they were merely converted merchant ships meant for training and escorting duty. 
Now three of them rested at the bottom of the ocean. The combined support fleet off the coast of Iwo Jima saw just 24 kamikazes. Navy officials could only hope that the phenomenon was dying down. They couldn't have been more wrong. Though the losses to the Navy support ships numbered into the hundreds, they paled in comparison to casualties on the island, where 6,000 were killed and another 17,000 were injured. Finally, on March 16th, after nearly a month of ferocious fighting, Iwo Jima could be called Allied territory. As the island hopping entered a brief quiet period, some of the carriers were removed back to their base in the Caroline Islands, over 1,200 miles from Iwo Jima. It was thought they'd be safe there. On the evening of March 11th, as the sailors were chatting before their nightly movie, some of the men saw a lone plane in the sky. John Montserrat, was aboard the USS Langley when his friend pointed out the plane. Tom said, look at that idiot flying around up there without any wing lights. That idiot, a fully armed kamikaze, dove his airplane and his bomb into the Randolph. After a huge explosion, there was a stunned silence for a moment. and then pandemonium, as ship after ship went to general quarters, darkened ship, and manned their guns. John Montserrat, USS Langley. On March 19th, two U.S. carriers fell prey to conventional dive bombers within two minutes of each other. The Wasp and the Franklin were both reminded that so-called old-fashioned weapons could be just as deadly as kamikazes. The blast from the Franklin could be heard on the USS Bunker Hill, stationed 50 miles away. Over the span of the war, the Franklin and its crew became the most decorated in Navy history. Two men aboard the carrier earned the Medal of Honor that day for extraordinary heroism during armed combat. One of them was Father Joseph T. O'Callaghan, seen here giving last rites. O'Callaghan earned the award by helping men find escape from within the smoky corridors and for directing the damage control efforts. His commander called him the bravest man I ever saw. The USS Franklin had served in the Marianas and the Carolines. It had been the first carrier ever hit by a suicide bomber and later rebounded after an even more serious kamikaze strike during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. But this attack was the knockout blow. The Franklin limped home to New York with a skeleton crew. The war was over for this Essex-class carrier. The kamikaze attacks shook Navy rank and file to the core. They tried to unwind, but the tension built daily. Clearly, they were never safe from a ramming attack, even in port. But they had no idea what other innovations of warfare the Japanese military was concocting. As the Allies prepared for their next move, carrier planes from the 58th Task Force witnessed something that defied description over the Japanese home island of Kyushu. Some new kind of winged bombs were strapped to the bottom of Mitsubishi bombers. The Allies had no way of knowing at the time that this was the next escalation of the divine wind concept. What they were looking at was a true death machine. <laughs> 
reality had to be faced. The Japanese people might one day have to defend their homeland from invasion by the American demons and their fortress-like bombers. They did what they could to protect themselves from these bombers, but the protection was designed for American B-25s. While the weapon of choice now for the Allies would be the massive B-29. B-29s fly at 30,000 feet. The surface-to-air missiles placed around Tokyo reached only 25,000 feet. To make matters worse, the Japanese fighter planes could not reach those altitudes either. The result was an air superiority that would thoroughly demoralize the Japanese military. After the capture of Iwo Jima, firebombing raids on Japanese cities started in earnest. And since most Japanese buildings were constructed of timber and pulp products, the incendiary bombs were viciously effective. On March 10th, more than one million were left homeless by the American air raid on Tokyo. Approximately 100,000 people were killed, and the super fortresses just kept coming. It seemed that there was nothing the Japanese army could do about it. Again, Japan was shocked at its vulnerability. No one more so than the newest advocate of the Kamikaze Corps, the head of the 5th Air Fleet. The enemy comes into our imperial city at high altitude and carries out indiscriminate bombing. It is a complete shock to see them do such things as bomb a shrine. Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki. Ugaki and his colleagues could come up with only one way to protect themselves against the B-29, which they begrudgingly gave the title of B-san, a mark of respect. They were called Tayatari, or ramming attacks, but the American aviators lumped them in with other suicide missions and called them kamikaze. Simply put, Japanese aviation engineers took all shielding and guns off their fighter planes to make them light enough to reach the same altitude as the super fortresses. Now that pilots could reach them, they were told to put themselves in between the Bisons and the homeland. The name of the new unit was Shinten, or Earth Shaking, and they held to the idea of Keshtai, or Dare to Die. Many did just that. When you saw one of those guys coming at you, said a member of one American bomber crew, it put a fear into you like you've never known. But the number of U.S. bombers was too overwhelming. The firebombs made some in Japanese society even more dedicated to the quickly disappearing dream of victory. After all, they had been told for years of the nightmare scenario in which American demons would wipe out their nation and take their women. It is not for the Emperor, no Japan, that I undertake this suicide attack, but solely for my beloved wife, Lieutenant Yukio Seki. 201st Air Group. But the violence also led others to wonder what they were fighting for, and if there was a way peace could be achieved without the complete destruction of their nation. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth when I think of the deceit being played on innocent citizens by some of our wily politicians. But I am willing to take orders from the high command and even from the politicians because I believe in the polity of Japan. Ensign Yamaguchi Teruo. At the same time, the Japanese developed a new chapter in suicide weaponry, the Oka, or Cherry Blossom Bomb. The first good look the Americans got at these suicide machines were several Oka 11s captured on Okinawa. Equipped with no takeoff or landing gear, these were true suicide machines. So simple in design, yet their rockets could propel them to 600 miles per hour. They were only 20 feet of tin and plywood, but each carried three rockets and 1,800 pounds of explosives. <laughs> 
But how did they work? Germany had startled the world with their V1 and V2. The German buzz bombs were used to amazing effectiveness against Britain, but they were blind bombs. Hitler's army merely pointed them, using the best coordinates they could manage at the time, and hoped to hit a significant target. The Nazis weren't completely satisfied with the devastation and thought, what if a rocket bomb could be steered? The Japanese were impressed with the technology that their Axis power friends were sharing with them, and they took it one step farther. The Allies may have called the Japanese rocket-propelled weapon the fool's bomb, but it was chillingly clever. The idea was that the Oka rode below a Mitsubishi bomber, which the Allies named the Betty Bomber. When the bomber approached the target, the pilot, part of the specially formed Thunder Gods unit, would climb down to the plane through the bomb bay. He would then speed toward the intended ship, with no other way to land but to crash. The speed was so blindingly fast that gunners hardly had a chance to aim. On the day this footage was shot, in March 1945, U.S. flyers noticed winged bombs underneath the Bettys they were attacking. They had no way of knowing they were suicide planes. All of the Bettys were shot down before they could release their payload. But the Okas would be back the following month to play a part in the sinking of an American destroyer and damaging a few other ships. Still, the Thunder Gods never truly had the opportunity to display what their powerful weapons could do. Also being constructed during this time were the Shinyo, or ocean-shaking boats, small vessels originally designed to drop depth charges alongside offshore ships. The people steering the craft had a narrow margin of escape. As the war got more and more hopeless, the kamikaze concept spread to other kinds of vessels, even these small boats powered by automobile and truck engines. The bows of these boats were loaded with explosives. They were meant to ram invading vessels close to shore. A plunger mechanism was added to ensure a massive explosion upon impact. Another method of special attack was born. As with the kamikaze planes and okas, the boat, the explosive, and the driver were one unit, one bomb. Almost completely undamaged, a flotilla of so-called suicide boats is discovered. When the Allies occupied Japan, they found hundreds of these boats, with evidence that many more were planned, all designed to thwart invasion of the homeland. It was more evidence of the government's commitment to preserving the Japanese spirit, even if it meant losing the Japanese people. Suicide attacks could be launched in many ways. These midget submarines were actually human torpedoes intended for a two-man suicide crew. They were called chitin, or heaven shakers. Various models were the five-man Kaiyu, called the Sea Dragon, and the Koryu, another tiny two-man sub. They were originally intended as stealth versions of their larger cousins. But by 1944, their conventional torpedoes were packed with hair-trigger charges and the operators of the boats were instructed to simply ram them into their target vessel. Japanese I-boats like these were quickly converted into motherships for these new mini-subs. In addition to regular torpedoes, they could now release these human torpedoes as well. They would sneak into a suitable range without detection, then release their chitons for a guaranteed hit. The suicide subs made their debut in a spectacular fashion with the sinking of this oiler, the USS Mississinawa. Chiton also sunk another destroyer escort and damaged several others. Records show that the Japanese were gearing up to produce many more of these suicide subs 
for the inevitable invasion of Japan. One can only wonder how much devastation they would have wrought. But the most incredible plan for a special attack was to take place off the coast of Okinawa. By the spring of 1945, the once proud Japanese Navy had been reduced to a handful of ships, with precious little fuel left even to operate them. The admirals of Japan hatched an idea to stave off the inevitable invasion of Okinawa, the logical stepping stone to the home islands of Japan. The plan was to send ten ships, virtually all that was left of the fleet, on a suicide assignment. Included would be the pride of the nation, the Yamato, the largest battleship ever built. The plan was to beach the Yamato. All 2,498 sailors aboard would man the guns until, one by one, they were all silenced. The crewmen never got a chance to display their Bushido-driven valor in combat. On the way to its date with destiny, the fleet, including the noble Yamato, met torpedoes launched from carrier planes of Admiral Mitcher's fabled Task Force 58. Mitcher's men were battle-hardened after involvement in every major action since the Marshall Islands in January of the previous year. It took a concerted effort from all of them to sink the mighty Japanese battleship. Perhaps Admiral Onishi was right after all. The Yamato might have done more good melted down and used for scrap to build airplanes. Gone with the Yamato was the hope for an easy victory at Okinawa. On the island hopping campaign toward the Japanese main island, Okinawa was the next logical place for the U.S. to strike. Both sides knew it. It was the largest island in the closest island chain to Japan proper. The Americans would need that springboard for final victory. At the time of the initial landings on April 1st, 1945, 155,000 men were deployed in Operation Iceberg. By the end of the battle, some 300,000 American troops were committed to the vicious fighting. Waiting for them were 120,000 dug-in Japanese troops. Five times as many as had so skillfully defended Iwo Jima. Supporting the Allied invasion was the largest fleet ever assembled. More than 1,200 ships of all kinds participated, including the contribution of the British fleet. To the Knights of the Divine Wind, this was an irresistible target. And they came out in waves. One sailor called them a swarm of angry bees. Another compared them to Indians circling a wagon trail. Colorful descriptions aside, the waves of kamikazes were so intense that most of the U.S. aerial assault runs were diverted to destroying their air bases. The fleet was so massive and the kamikaze corps so important to the imperial cause that Japanese soldiers on the island were told to cease fire while the kamikazes did their work. In this final year of the war, Admiral Mark A. Mitcher was the leader of the fast carrier group Task Force 58. Considering the kamikaze's love of destroying flat tops, that was a dangerous position to hold. Early in the battle, the well-liked Mitcher decided to make the Bunker Hill his flagship. He was often on deck in his famous baseball cap. On May 11th at 10.04, he got an up-close look at the hazard that his sailors had been dealing with for months. A Zero sneaked past a combat air patrol and smashed into 34 planes on the deck of the Bunker Hill. Less than a minute later, a Judy smashed through the aft flight deck. The whole thing happened less than 100 feet from where the Admiral was standing. <laughs> 
the Bunker Hill would go on to fight another day, but 353 of its men, including 13 from the Admiral's staff, wouldn't. As the Bunker Hill made its repairs, Mitcher prepared to transfer his flag to another flat top. His entire quarters had been destroyed, along with all of his records. Here we see the Admiral and the surviving members of his staff boarding the USS Enterprise, hoping to command from this vantage point. But just three days later, the Enterprise fell into the sights of 28 enemy aircraft. One of them got through the ak, -AK fire to hit smack into the middle of the ship. Legend has it that while all around him hit the deck, Mitcher was on his feet for the entire affair. Although the old lady sustained relatively light casualties, the physical damage was severe. She had fought in every major battle in the Pacific theater, but this was the last day of the war for the Big E. For his part, Mitcher transferred once again, this time to the USS Randolph, which had taken its own lumps that fateful night at Utili back in March, when all hands went to general quarters instead of the nightly movie. He had more reasons than ever for pleading with the Pacific commander to finally get rid of those kamikaze air bases. With still no tangible way to repel the aerial kamikazes, the commander-in-chief for the Pacific Theater, Admiral Nimitz, conferred with other high-ranking officials and even put out a call to everyone in the fleet for ideas on how to reduce the menace. Someone, although history does not know exactly who, came up with the picket defense. It involves sending smaller craft, destroyers, and minesweepers ahead of the fleet in the hopes of picking up the kamikazes on radar before they hit the main fleet and the Navy's precious aircraft carriers. It was a dangerous assignment, and some of the men called the pickets tethered goats, after the age-old shepherd's trick of sending the weakest of the flock to be attacked by wolves to save the rest. Indeed, the desperate kamikazes, wanting to do anything to avoid returning home to face the shame of failure and the prospect of preparing once again to die, descended on these smaller craft with a vengeance. It seemed by this point that a kamikaze would go after any kind of allied vessel from battleship to troop transports. Although the picket defense worked, the casualties were high as were the numbers of sinkings. On April 6, 1945, the destroyer USS Bush was manning radar picket number one off Okinawa. At 3.15 p.m., a single-engine fighter, codenamed Jill, slammed into the stacks of the Bush. Its bomb took out everything from the engine room to the galley and sick bay. I was one of the first to get up the ladder to the second level. Most of the men didn't make it up because of the steam. Once topside, we found out what kind of shape we were in. We were burning below decks and dead in the water. Frank Grigsby, water tender third class. There were still a dozen hellbirds in the sky, and every time a nearby vessel would approach to help the bush, it too would be attacked. Then, another plane hit the ship. The flames subsided, but it was a lost cause. Captain Rollin E. Westholm was the last to leave the ship, and then only after the doctor threatened to shoot him off. We were watching the bridge in the bow burn when she finally slipped into the water. The flag that flew so proudly on the bow was the last thing I saw go under. I cried. James Oakey Reader, USS Bush. Many were saved that day by nearby rescue ships, 
It took two months to neutralize the deeply dug-in garrison of soldiers at Okinawa. Combat had been more ferocious than ever as the suicide concept extended to the ground war. Human bullets, soldiers with explosives strapped to their bodies, took out tanks. Again, there seemed to be no defense against someone bent on sacrificing himself. The Japanese people braced for the invasion of the homeland. Ordinary civilians were being organized into their own suicide brigades, while the entire military was put on notice to convert to special attack duty. Leaders envisioned a force of nearly 100 million, all willing to kill themselves in the effort to repel the invaders. Radio Tokyo boasted that the sooner the Americans attacked, the better. With victory so distant and devastation so near, the Emperor's subjects continued to fight. Even if we are defeated, the noble spirits of the Kamikaze attack corps will keep our homeland from ruin. Without this spirit, our nation would cease to exist. Admiral Takijiro Onishi. The Japanese military stepped up its production of suicide submarines, and a bold plan was formulated to launch the Okas from catapults at the invading Allied ships in order to overcome the lack of aircraft to carry the human bombs. And still, aerial kamikazes continued to strike. Through June and July, they attacked any ships they could reach. As July became August, nearly 5,500 planes of all kinds were earmarked for one-way missions, and an equal number of pilots were in training for special attacks. If all of these planes were actually launched, this horrible war could have been prolonged even further causing unimaginable agony on both sides. Some historians believe that the prospect of widespread ramming attacks directed against an invasion of the main Japanese island contributed to President Harry S. Truman's decision to unleash the atomic bomb. The horror of the atomic bombs may have brought about the end of the war, but it also opened up a new chapter of fear and panic. The West could not understand how the military could organize suicide bombers against military targets. The East could not understand how the United States could kill so many women and children in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On August 15, 1945, the impossible happened. The voice of the sacred crane was heard for the first time by his subjects. The emperor made a radio address informing Japan that he was ready to call a halt to the war. His subjects had been prepared to fight to the end, and now they were giving their country to their mortal enemy. Hundreds committed suicide so as not to face the dishonor. After hearing the Emperor's words, Admiral Lugaki, the revered head of Japan's 5th Air Fleet, boarded a plane in search of the enemy and implored his pilots to carry on with the struggle. He was never heard from again. Harakuri was the samurai's way of avoiding shame through ritual suicide. In the final days, Harakuri was invoked by the father of the kamikaze. Exhausted, Admiral Onishi, father of the divine wind, followed the men he directed to death. Finally, peace came with the signing of formal terms of surrender on September 2, 1945. The solemn ceremony took place aboard the battleship Missouri, which had shrugged off kamikaze attacks herself. Since then, the two countries have become allies. <laughs>
The era of the kamikaze seems a nightmare dreamt long ago. A poem by Admiral Onishi, the architect of the Japanese Special Attack Corps, says it all. In blossom today, then scattered. Life is so like a delicate flower. How can one expect the fragrance to last forever? Mm -hmm.